Liu is a self-admitted evangelist for citizen participation in American civic life. A former advisor and speechwriter to President Bill Clinton, Liu is a lawyer, author, and speaker, and co-founder and CEO of Citizen University. Liu started Civic Saturday Gatherings, where people meet face-to-face -to, -face to discuss the values of being contributing members of civic life in the United States. Civic Saturdays now exist in over 30 cities. Eric Liu's latest book is Become America, Civic Sermons on Love, Responsibility, and Democracy. Eric Liu, welcome to CrossCut Now. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so delighted to be with you. I can't remember exactly when I started hearing about Civic Saturdays, but certainly a lot of people who I've come in contact with have told me about these great events that have happening that started. Can you tell me a little bit about what they are, what is the environment, and why they seem to be taking off? Civic Saturdays are these gatherings that uh, are essentially a civic analog to a faith gathering. Um, it, it's not church or synagogue or mosque, but it has the flow and the feel of such a gathering, and it's fundamentally about what you might think of as American civic religion, um, about a creed of values and uh, beliefs that we have to all, not necessarily agree to, but all kind of reckon with as Americans. What do we mean by liberty and justice for all? What do we mean by equal protection of the laws? What do we mean by uh, various kind of American slogans, and how do we actually put that into practice um, in our everyday lives, and not just in national politics, but actually primarily in place where we live, in this city and in Seattle. Um, and so we started organizing these gatherings that they have the flow of a faith gathering. We people uh, gather together, we sing together. Uh, we, sing? we sing, we sing a you know, song together, we, uh, we turn to the strangers next to us and talk about a common question. Um, there are readings of texts that you might think of as civic scripture, um, whether it's famous texts like the preamble of the Constitution or an MLK speech uh, or things that you've never heard of from um, other figures uh, in American history. Um, and then those uh, readings tee up a, a sermon uh, that is meant to really connect the dots between our history um, and the ethical choices and controversies of our times. And then again, from a, a, a moral standpoint, what are we called to do and sh how do we show up in civic life right now, right, for each other and in our community? And then afterwards, people form up in circles to not only talk about what they've heard that day, but to really to think about how can we uh, convert these ideas into deeds. Did you grow up in a religious household? Not at all, actually. Um, I grew up, uh, I'm the son of immigrants. Uh, my parents were born in China and uh, uh, went to Taiwan during the years of war and revolution and then came to the U.S. Uh, in the late 1950s. And they themselves weren't raised in any um, uh, religious uh, faith tradition. Um, and so, um, you know, I grew up uh, um, aware um, and I grew up in upstate New York and so had friends of every faith and every background. Uh, but I think apart from what you're raised in, there's a question of wiring. Uh, I think all humans are wired uh, for belief. All humans seek mm -hmm. some measure of meaning-making, belonging, and cosmological explanations that lead a lot of folks to go to organized faith traditions. Um, uh, and I have that wiring really strong. Uh, had I been raised uh, anything, had I been raised Jewish, Buddhist, Catholic, whatever, I'd be yeah. hardcore that, right? And instead, I channeled that wiring uh, as I grew older and got more involved in, in, in the community and the world. Uh, I channeled that toward the American idea and toward what this is that, particularly as a son of immigrants, I felt like all I had was the dumb luck to be born here. And how, I, how was I going to show up and actually claim these ideas and claim responsibility for um, helping our country live up to its promises and its ideas? So I think um, I'm also the child of immigrants, and I think that notion of patriotism is very, very present often among children of immigrants. You see that. Sometimes I, you know, I would l look at my mom, and she's sometimes more patriotic than, than I am in terms of sort of actions or things that she's willing to say. Um, and, and so I'm with you in terms of being wired mm -hmm. in that way, but it also seems like there comes a point when disillusionment and just anger and frustration that, yes, we may be a, hist we may be a, a country of some things, of some ideals, but mm -hmm. those are ideals that we, we haven't even reckoned with. Tell me a little bit about the calling that you have, and uh, is this a naive way of thinking? Uh, I think it's quite not naive, actually. I think it's rather clear-eyed about what it actually means to live in a community and in a country like ours that is so diverse and far-flung, and all we have to hold ourselves together as a country is a set of words, is a set of creedal documents and a set of ideas. 
Um, I, I want to go back to your idea about patriotism. To me, true patriotism is not rah-rah, chest-thumping, we're number one, jingoism. Uh, true patriotism is actually naming exactly what you just named, which is we have this creed, and it's rather unique. Some say exceptional. But the fact that it's unique, you know, there is no Chinese idea. There's no Chinese creed that my parents uh, and, and people of their generation uh, were pressured to live up to and held their country to account for not living up to. But I don't look at our American creed and say, oh, let's pat ourselves on the back. Aren't we awesome? I look at that as an exceptional burden. Because exactly as you said, we have never yet actually lived up to our creed. We have not yet lived up to our promises. We forget about, I mean, you can name the fact that this country was built upon slavery and genocide um, and that we fast forward today and still have deeply entrenched institutional racism, sexism, and the things that you were describing and the ways in which uh, economically today the game is so fundamentally rigged to reward the already privileged. Um, but true patriotism to me um, is about saying, okay, we have this creed and we have this incredible gap between our creed, our ideals, and our actual institutions, right? True patriotism is closing that gap. That's all it is. If you are a patriot, you are relentlessly trying to figure out how do I move my country into closer alignment with its stated promises? N number one, I mean, I think... You're well-educated. You, you know, worked for the Clinton administration. You can afford to do these things on a Saturday uh, and, ha and have, have this notion of, of bringing people together. And, and, some, and other people have, have bigger worries. Yeah, so one of the things, one of the ways I've been uh, active in civic life in Seattle was I was one of the catalytic fo folks involved in the fight for 15. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we now, every politician and everybody, not only in, in Washington State, but nationally on the progressive side, um, you know, declares himself a believer in the fight for 15. But when that fight was getting started, um, it wasn't even just, you know, union leaders like David Rolfe, uh, people like me and, and my friend Nick Hanauer who were laying out ideas and the framework for for, for making the case uh, for a minimum wage hike, which was a case based on what we call middle out economics, not trickle down economics. Forget about that. The people who drove and, and catalyzed that bottom up movement were low wage workers, were immigrants, were people of color who were working two shifts uh, in the airport and hospitality industries in SeaTac. Um, and they were people who didn't have privilege, they were people who didn't have opportunity, and they were people who decided this game is too rigged, we're going to start showing up. And so after their second shift, they started collecting signatures in SeaTac. After their second shift, they started talking to their neighbors and their friends and their family members about why they needed to get a $15 minimum wage in SeaTac. And when they succeeded there, that set in motion the, the dominoes falling uh, for Seattle. At the time, our city council election and mayoral election, everybody got on that bandwagon. But the thing that is important to, to know about that story and that case study is it was precisely the people who are feeling burdened by our rigged game right now. Uh, th these were people who, because uh, they had relatively less economic opportunity and power, could have had every excuse to say, I don't have, I time, have time for that. Right. I don't have time. They made time. And because they made time, they changed the game and the story and the equation of power in our city and our country. And you think human beings are inherently that selfless? Uh, to to no. think about other people? Uh, I, think he, I think, no, I think human beings are wired for self-interest, but I th and, and that's always true, and that will always be true. And I think that how we define self-interest can change and has changed. So we live in American life in a, with a very individualistic, short-term sense of self-interest, what's good for me right now. Right. And what grown-ups realize, and what societies that have uh, more inclusive uh, institutions in ours have figured out um, is that true self-interest is mutual interest, that we're all better off when we're all better off. So I go back to the $15 minimum wage. The case that we made for raising the wage was not a case of altruism and selflessness and, oh, businesses should just be nicer and pay their employees more, right? Sure, they should be, but that wasn't the argument we made. The argument we made was this. When workers have more money, businesses have more customers. That when you raise the wage, and when someone who's making nine bucks an hour starts making 12, 13, 15 dollars an hour, where does that surplus go? Where does that differential go? They're not parking that extra three, four dollars an hour uh, in some offshore account in the Cayman Islands. They're actually spending that money on a, a meal with their spouse, on back to school clothes for their kids, uh, on making rent this month, right? 
um, in ways that actually uh, put their money into circulation and help, again, promote the idea that we're all better off when we're all better off. And you think about every immigrant community that's ever landed on the shores of the, of the United States, how they have gotten their start has been through mutual aid, not everybody going off their own way and thinking they're a rugged individualist. Um, and we, as an entire country, have to learn from these kinds of communities about what it means actually to sustain a sense of common cause uh, and collective strength, because when you do that, you realize, again, it actually benefits you, the individual, when we are looking out for each other. And that's clear-eyed. It's not naive. Do you think there needs to be some sort of government program or something that um, everybody is required to do that especially addresses, you know, that would be, go beyond r issues of race and class and would uh, so, sort of build a, a common mm. lived experience or a notion of sacrifice? Yeah, I, I'm a big, uh, A, I, I think we ought to have a draft. If we're in a time of war, let's stop subcontracting 17 years of war to 1% of the population. They keep going back over and over again to serve. If we're going to have a war and, and call it a, a war on terror, then let's grow up as a country and actually say, we're going to spread the burden and the sacrifice of that war. That, that will get this country to sit up uh, and stop treating this as just a thing in the background. Right. Uh, it will force some policy change, but it's more, uh, th that's number one. But number two, I'm a huge believer um, in national service. Actually, if I could wave a wand, I would, I would like mandatory national service um, that young people uh, you know, ought, ought to um, have a year, uh, a subsidized year of service to their country. And you can choose military service or civilian service. You can do um, AmeriCorps. You can go into the Marine Corps, whatever it might be. Um, but um, we need, just as you said, some kind of shared um, formative experience um, that is not about me and not about you, but about us working on some, um, some third thing together. Thank you very much, Eric Liu. It was really nice to meet you, and I'm sure I'll see you in Seattle. Florangela, it's been great to talk with you. Thank Thanks. You.